Somerville. We are talking today with Ben Downing, former Somerville resident, uh, though he calls Pittsfield and East Boston home, who is running for governor. Hello today. Thanks for having me, Kat. It's great to be here. Oh, very happy to have you. So uh, you are uh, a former Tufts graduate student, which is how we, we claim you as one of our own from Somerville. So why are you running for governor? I'm running for governor to build a fairer, stronger Massachusetts. Uh, I think the potential of Massachusetts is limitless. We have uh, the, the creativity, we have the, the spirit in our communities and the innovative companies that call Massachusetts home. Uh, we have the ability to do big things, to take on the big challenges facing us on climate change, on economic fairness, on racial justice. And what's been missing is a sense of urgency from our leadership to get out of the status quo and the way we normally do things that too often kicks the can down the road. We need an urgent sense of leadership. That's why I want to, uh, that's why I'm running for governor. That's what I want to bring to this race uh, into Massachusetts. A lot of your platform is talking about climate control. Is that, is that the urgency? Uh, it's absolutely a huge part of it, right? You know, it is one of those issues where even more so than energy, the least renewable resource when it comes uh, to climate is time. And every time we delay action or we don't take action on the scale that is necessary to confront the climate crisis, right? We, we put it off and we add to the cost and we burden future generations with having to take those steps. It's time for Massachusetts to step up, uh, to take the important steps that match the moment and the science. And in so doing, we can capture the economic benefits of building a clean energy economy. You know, Somerville is a leader in this way with Greentown Labs right there with some of the most innovative companies in the country developing climate solutions right now. So we can not only uh, do the right thing by the, the climate, but in so doing, we can build a fairer, stronger economy for years to come. It's a huge part of that sense of urgency uh, that we need to bring to our leadership, that we need to bring to Beacon Health. So you're from East Boston, not very far from Somerville. Um, what are some of the climate issues that are facing us in this, 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 this particular area of Eastern Massachusetts? Yeah, so I think when you look at some of the core issues that maybe not everyone thinks of them as a climate issue, but certainly I do, transportation and housing are two of the first uh, that come to mind. Um, for the better part of the last 40 years in Massachusetts, uh, we have continued to kick the can down the road when it comes to our transportation system. And that has harmed every region of the state. That's true of East Boston, that's true of Somerville, that's true of Pittsfield and the 51 other communities I represented in Western Massachusetts. Right? We have a transportation system that doesn't help us build a fairer, stronger economy. It doesn't help us adapt to and mitigate climate change because it puts more and more people into cars because our public transit has not been reliable and we haven't made the investments in it that we need to make, right? So I think transportation is certainly a climate issue. Housing is a climate issue, right? We need to make sure that everyone has access uh, to affordable housing uh, that ideally is walkable uh, to uh, economic opportunities, ideally that is walkable, bikeable, or accessible by public transit. Uh, to uh, the social amenities that make our communities the special places that they are. And we know in Somerville, in East Boston, and in many parts of the greater Boston area, you know, working families are being pushed out of communities that they have called home for generations, and then are further and further from the economic opportunities, the jobs that they're trying to access. So transportation and housing, I think, are two of the key uh, climate issues that I see every day here in East Boston, and certainly that I've heard from talking with friends and leaders and other folks who are engaged in summer. How do you fix housing? So I think it's a variety of different steps. Uh, the housing choices legislation that was recently passed is a good initial first step. But what the state needs to be doing is making a greater investment in workforce housing and affordable housing. Certainly we are seeing a significant growth of investment uh, in the housing market over the past few years, but a lot of that again is pushing out uh, folks whose wages have not grown as they have at the upper end of the economic spectrum. So we need to build housing that allows people to stay in their communities, build more affordable housing, build more workforce housing. That requires the state to make an investment. Yes, reform and update our zoning laws. Yes, put in place tenant protections, but also make sure that the state is investing to create those opportunities. 
Uh, another part of this too, Kat, is it's not just a housing problem, it's an economic development problem. For the last 30 or 40 years in Massachusetts, uh, we have seen economic opportunity consolidate around greater Boston, even though there are significant inequities and inequalities within the greater Boston area. We've seen jobs and opportunity consolidate at the eastern end of the state, while gateway cities, places like Pittsfield and Holyoke, Lawrence and Lowell, uh, New Bedford, Fall River, Fitchburg, you name them, have seen their traditional industries leave, and we have seen those economies weaken. If we can target more of our economic development incentives to gateway cities and regions outside of greater Boston, we can take advantage of the fact that those are radically different housing markets, right? You know, so if we can uh, create more economic opportunity in those communities, we're able to take advantage of the housing stock in those communities, give people more starter homes, access to homes they can afford, and we can build a stronger, fairer, more stable economy than the, the significant inequities we have from one community to the next within one community uh, and another. So when we're talking about transportation, mm -hmm you know, in greater Boston and maybe even, you know, chunks like uh, Worcester, Lowell, Lawrence, we talk about regional networks. Mm -hmm. So what does transportation mean statewide? So uh, I think you said the key word there, which is regional, right? There are significant regional differences in what the transportation needs are from the Berkshires, even to the Pioneer Valley, from the Cape, uh, to Greater Boston, the South Coast, up to the Merrimack Valley, and, and certainly in and around uh, the MBTA service territory here. Um, I also think, again, regional is the way to start to, uh, to solve our transportation problems. Yes, the state needs to make a greater investment in transportation and in transit specifically. Transit to make sure that we have options to get us out of cars, out of congested traffic, and not adding to the climate crisis with how we connect ourselves from one part of our community to the next. So yes, the state needs to make investments in those projects that cross from one region to the next. So South Coast Rail, uh, West to East Rail, connecting uh, Albany uh, to Boston um, and, and running right in uh, through Worcester. Uh, but then when we get to those specific regional needs, what Massachusetts should do and we don't, is empower regions to be able to raise revenue to make the investments in their, uh, in their specific unique needs. So in many other parts of the country, they have regional ballot initiatives where every three years and every five years and or every five years, they go out to the voters with a series of priorities to make investments in the transportation system in that region, generally through county governments, but through other structures as well. Um, and it's put to the voters a plan and the taxes to fund that plan for the transportation system of that region. We don't have that in Massachusetts now, and that erodes trust. So people in Western Mass, um, you know, look at transportation funding and say, well, the BRTA doesn't even run past 7 p.m. at night. It doesn't run on Sundays. We'd do anything to get uh, the same level of service that the T has. And when I talk to transportation planners here in my neighborhood in East Boston, they say, well, we're spending way too much dollars uh, per person on road and bridge projects out in Western Mass, right? We need to be able to target the specific unique needs of a region and meet those um, uh, with, uh, with regional ballot initiatives, right? And I think that's a way to, to get out of the log jam status quo that we've been in. So yes, in Western Mass and in Central Mass, uh, as we solve climate change, that'll be more of a reliance on electric vehicles and more of an investment in the basic infrastructure that's out there. And here in Eastern Mass, it's gonna be much more around expanding the MBTA services, uh, around building out of the, the regional rail system above and beyond what we have with the, the current commuter rail system. So when you're raising revenues, so Pittsfield would pay for Pittsfield and Lawrence would pay for Lawrence? Uh, when when we're talking about specific needs in that region. So if it's a, it's a project or a program that goes outside of that region, that should be a state priority, right? So it is not about dividing up the existing pool that we have. That has to be a baseline that we start from. And then if there are significant programs and projects that connect one region to the next, that's a state investment. But if we're talking about you know, a new line on the, the BRTA in the Berkshires, that's something that the Berkshires ought to be able to vote on and determine 
how they fund that, how they meet that. Again, off of the, the statewide baseline. What brought you to talking about the climate and you know, ba basing a lot of your run on climate issues? Yeah, so the, the first moment for me, and, and we released this as a part of uh, the climate plan, was a class I took in college um, with Professor Tony Affini at, at Providence College. And I think most folks, when it comes to issues that you're passionate about in any way, you have that, that moment that, you know, that one teacher, that one job, that one experience. And politics of the environmental movement for me with Tony Affini was the moment that I came away from saying, you know, I knew and had a hunch that politics and public service would be a part of my future. Um, I didn't know before that class that the focus on climate would be there. And I came away from that class saying, you know, there's no way to avoid uh, being a part of politics and public service without taking on what is one of, if not the defining challenges uh, of our generation, of our time. Um, so that, that was the first moment for me. Uh, the second moment, right, was working for Congressman John Olver from Western Massachusetts, who was a real leader around climate issues, you know, himself a, a, a trained uh, scientist, a trained rocket scientist, and a, a former professor uh, at UMass, right? So working for Congressman Olver and, and, and understanding better the science of climate uh, was another moment that got me. And then when I was first elected to the state Senate, about three months after uh, I was sworn into office, we had three paper plants in the Southern Berkshires closed because their electric rates skyrocketed. Out of the blue, none of them knew it was coming. Um, and I sat in, in gymnasiums with families who had worked at these mills for one generation, two generations, three generations, who were looking to their public leader saying, where do we go now? Right? Like this has been what we do. It's gone through changes in ownership. How, how do we, you know, how do we find a way? How do we pay the mortgage? How do we pay our bills? And as I looked at those faces and saw friends and family members and neighbors, what I saw beyond, you know, a significant challenge and a crisis in the moment was also a failure for us to control our own energy future, right? We're at the end of a pipeline here in Massachusetts. We don't have natural gas. We don't have oil. What we do have are innovative companies. What we do have is a commitment to the environment. And we ought to be able to not only, you know, with hold up those values, but support those families as well. And, you know, that's a commitment that I then made in my own professional life to make sure that, you know, if I was ever in a room like that, again, I would be able to say, here's every step we took to make sure you have the opportunity uh, to continue to, to live up to your God given talent and not be at the whim of, you know, an electric rate spike from time to time. So uh, talk a little bit about public service. This is a family business for you. I grew up in a family where um, you know, we talked often at the, the kitchen table about politics and about public service. My dad ran for district attorney uh, in 1990 when I was nine years old. I was the oldest of four uh, growing up, so I was the one who got pushed out on the campaign trail with him. Um, I thought politics at that point was holding signs, eating donuts, um, and, and getting to go to a million fun events. Um, and as much as that was fun as a nine-year-old, what I really loved was seeing people come up to my dad and talk to him about their hopes and their dreams for their community, but also about their fears, right? You know, there was a time where Pittsfield was going through a significant transition and not an easy one, and one with a lot of pain. I had friends on my Little League team who were there at the start of the season, whose parents were transferred mid-season and they were gone, right? You know, a real disruption uh, in our community. and. At the same point, my parents reminded us often that we were middle class and lucky to be, and that we were there because folks had sacrificed to make sure there were opportunities there for us, and that we had a responsibility to do the same in our community. Um, and and you know, for my dad, and ultimately for me, um, politics was you know the the way to give back, and it wasn't something I I always thought was going to be the case. Um, but I know for me, after my dad passed away, my dad died in, in 2003 uh, while I was working in Washington, D.C., and I saw that community, you know, just come together around my family. Um, you know, it was, it was sudden, it was tragic, and we could have easily fallen apart as a family, and our community didn't let us, right? They were there for us in every way possible, um, and, you know, that's a debt that to this day I still don't feel like I'm able to repay. Um, and in that sense, I felt driven every day. It's, it's why I decided to run for the state Senate. 
Um, it, it's what drove me every day while I did that work. Um, and and it, it informed the type of leader that I try to be because you can't go through something like that and not have it deep in your empathy. You can't go through something like that and not have it you know, add to your sense of urgency because you know that tomorrow is not a given. And you know, that was true when my dad passed. It was true when my brother passed nine years later, right? Same genetic heart disease, same thing. And the, the, the community came together and rallied around us. And so, yeah, politics and public services in my blood to a degree, but it also was taken to a different level by those, those experiences in my life. Unusual to leave college to run for office? Uh, yeah, well, grad school. Grad school. Grad school. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, I, I figured if all else failed, uh, when people asked me, what did I do with my summer? I could say, well, I ran for the state Senate and lost. What'd you do? And, and then, uh, you know, then by the, the landslide margin of 243 votes out of 23,647 that were cast, um, you know, I was able to, to come back to Tufts a little bit later. And when people said, what have you been up to? I, said, I, I went and got elected to the state Senate. And, uh, you know, thanks to the support from friends and family members. And I, I just, you know, still to this day, I think I'm the luckiest guy on the planet to get the opportunity to spend every day trying to give back to a community that had given me every opportunity in life and, and hopefully, you know, pass on a little bit more. You surfed Pittsfield. You're in East Boston now. Why East Boston? So you know, first I had term limited myself. I, I made a promise in 2006 that I wouldn't serve more than five terms. I, I think our government generally um, and our democracy generally works best when talented people come in and out of it and bring their different experiences, their different points of view, new energy, a new set of eyes on, on the problems, right? So I had decided I would not run for re-election uh, in 2016. Uh, knew what I didn't want to do, which was I didn't want to be a lobbyist. Uh, I didn't want to go into government relations. I wanted to be a part of a, a growing company and hopefully a growing company with a mission. And I was lucky enough to, to find that in Nexamp, the, the veteran founded solar developer uh, that I went to work for. Um, and to do that, you know, Nexamp was based here in Boston. Uh, my wife, Michaela, at the time was working at Greentown Labs in Somerville. She has since uh, gone over to work at the innovation lab at Boston University. And we wanted to be under one roof. Uh, you know, the nature of my job was such that we were trading weekends back and forth between Eastern Mass and Western Mass uh, and had never had an extended period where we had, you know, we had our family under one roof and um, we're lucky enough over the last four years to be blessed with two sons. Um, Malcolm will turn four at the end of April and Eamon will turn one at the end of April. Um, and, you know, it's important for, for me to have been there for them under this one roof and chasing them around like, uh, like nuts. So that's, that's how we landed in East Boston, which interestingly enough is where my, uh, my Irish immigrant relatives first came to the country uh, two generations ago. So why run now? I think the biggest reason why for me, Kat, is working for Nexamp. The first couple of years, my job was to be out setting up our teams in the Midwest, in the Mid-Atlantic, looking for new opportunities for the company to invest and grow. And every time I would do that, be out on the road for, say, you know, a couple of days for a week, I'm out meeting with electrical contractors, unions, environmental organizations. And I'm, I'm a political nerd. At night, I'm trying to figure out what else is going on in the state besides the type of projects that we're trying to build. And I would get all excited. I would see, you know, states leading on childcare, on transportation, on anti-poverty and anti-hunger efforts. And I'd, you know, I'd take down my notes. I'd see what was going on. I'd get all excited. And I would come back uh, here and I would look up at where I used to work. And I didn't see that same sense of urgency that I was seeing in other states. And I would come back from these other states that I didn't feel like nearly had the resources and the potential that Massachusetts had. But what they did have was that greater sense of urgency that was allowing them to do more with the less that they had than we were doing with the abundance uh, that we had here in Massachusetts. And that more than anything else was the, the thing I couldn't get away from, right? That, that the idea that has driven me into this race, that we have this unlimited potential in Massachusetts. What we don't have is the leadership that is tapping into it to build a fairer, stronger Massachusetts for everyone. So that's, that's the why at this moment, that I, I see this opportunity and I see the need for that urgency. And I think given my experience in the public sector and the private sector, you know, having made a home in the western end of the state, now the eastern end of the state, 
I would hope I have the ability to try to connect people and bring us together uh, to, to build that fair, stronger Massachusetts. The current leadership, mm -hmm. are you talking about the legislature, which is mostly Democratic in Massachusetts, or are you talking about uh, Republican uh, Charlie Baker, the governor? Primarily the governor and his administration, but it is both the governor and the legislature. Um, you know, I think running as a Democrat, um, you need to be honest about the fact that we have in the legislature uh, been given significant power uh, in the terms of the, the majorities in the House and the Senate that from time to time we have used, but not nearly often enough to meet the needs and the challenges in our communities. I think that started to change uh, a little bit recently, but it's true generally that the, the status quo on Beacon Hill is difficult to shake up, right? And I've, I've been there, I've been in those fights, in those debates. I know that there are a lot of good people trying to do it. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to state leadership, it is primarily uh, a shortcoming and a failure of Governor Baker, uh, but the legislature owns it as well. There have been a number of Republican governors in this mostly blue state. What makes your campaign different? That will, that will, that, what, what's going to change that? I think we understand um, the, the why for that, right? You know, it, it's not just an ideological uh, debate or decision that voters make when they look at who they're voting for for governor. It's not just a values test like it might be for a legislative office. But voters look at a candidate for governor, especially a Democratic candidate for governor, and say, how do I know I can trust that you will stand up for me and that you will stand up for the public's interest, even in and especially when that requires disagreeing with people who you come from the same party as, right? Disagreeing with members of your own party. And I have a track record of my time in the Senate as yes, being a progressive, but also being independent, right? And breaking with the Patrick administration when I disagreed with them on policy, breaking with my colleagues in the legislature when I disagreed with them on policy, but doing so in a way that, yeah, that might be the disagreement of the day, but the next day I was able to find common ground with those same colleagues and find a way to work to address uh, our shared interests. Um, and so I think what I bring to the race is an understanding that we need to be able to address that trust question. So how do you do that? First, we're not taking donations from lobbyists or PACs. So that if you're a voter and you look at the policy proposals that my campaign rolls out, you may well disagree with them, but you will know that that is a good, honest disagreement. It's not because someone threw an event, someone whispered in my ear, someone influenced someone else, right? It's a good, honest disagreement about what is in the best interest of Massachusetts and building a fairer, stronger Massachusetts. That's one way you do it. The second way you do it is with those policy programs and proposals, right? Um, we are starting with climate, but we'll be rolling out uh, or somewhere around 10 to a dozen of these policy action plans so that voters will be able to clearly see the choice they have when they go to the ballot September of next year and then November of next year, right? And I think that again is how you build trust, running on a clear platform so that voters know what they can expect when you come into office and that that platform is one that is not just uh, about sort of the, the, uh, the shared interests of one party, but it's about building a fairer, stronger Massachusetts, a more open and accessible government. Um, and you'll see that in policy proposals like an independent redistricting commission, same day registration uh, for voting, uh, and other uh, government reforms to try to make Beacon Hill more open, accessible, and transparent for everyone, right? And those are proposals that in many cases, members of the Democratic majority will disagree with. And I'm ready to have that open, honest debate because I think that makes us a, a healthier, stronger democracy. It, it isn't just about consensus for consensus's sake. It's about being clear about the choices that are in front of us and how we get there. And I think that's how you build trust. So how is Charlie Baker doing? I think Charlie Baker is a good man and a dedicated public servant. Uh, but I think when it comes to the major challenges facing Massachusetts, he has failed to spend his significant political capital to address those challenges, whether it's transportation, uh, climate change, COVID response, education. Um, again, like he's a good man and a dedicated public servant. We have strong disagreements about the issues. 
And I think it's important to go out there and have that debate on the issues. And I think, unfortunately, Governor Baker has come up short. In particular, the COVID response has been uh, everyone from the CDC to the guy on the street in Somerville has something to say about the Massachusetts COVID response. What would you have done differently? So when it comes to the COVID response specifically, um, and, and in particular to the vaccine rollout, right? On the vaccine rollout, we would have had a centralized pre-registration website that would have taken much of the frustration and the anxiety uh, out of uh, folks chasing vaccination appointments. My, my brother and my sister and I have more text messages than I care to admit uh, between the three of us trying to find our mother an appointment. Now, ultimately, our mother is out walking with her friend uh, who's walking her dog, and they, they across the street from someone start having a conversation. And my mom then sends a picture to all of us an hour later of her getting a shot because they found out there were a couple of extra appointments out at Berkshire Community College, right? So no, no way to run a railroad, but this has been uh, you know, a personal issue for us too. We've seen it in our own family. So centralized pre-registration because it would have taken out that frustration, that anxiety. Um, we wouldn't have scrapped the 20 year playbook that Massachusetts had invested in with its local boards of health uh, in building a, uh, a pandemic response plan. We would have built off that pandemic response plan and empowered local boards of health uh, local providers, pharmacists, um, local healthcare providers uh, to be able to uh, provide uh, more of the vaccination because one of the issues we're seeing is uh, a lack of, of trust and some concern uh, at the mass vaccination sites. You can actually get it that much quicker if you're working from a place of trust with your local provider going there instead of sending someone from Pittsfield down to Foxborough, sending someone from the Cape out to the Berkshires. I mean, the amount of stories I've heard about people crisscrossing the state to get appointments is maddening. So centralized pre-registration, building off of the local boards of health uh, and our local health care providers. Uh, and, and then what centralized pre-registration would have allowed us to do is to more directly and clearly prioritize equity to get uh, vaccination and shots to the communities that had the highest COVID infection rates, and we should have been investing in community-based organizations to do direct outreach. We've seen many municipal and local leaders like Mayor Arrigo in Revere, like Representative Vargas in Haverhill, and countless others doing direct outreach in their communities to try to pull in folks who otherwise may have been hesitant to get the vaccine. Um, the state is just now starting to support some of that work. We should have been planning around that and building on that from the beginning. All right, so in our last moment, um, this is an unusual time to be campaigning. In this time of COVID, will you be doing in-person campaign stops? Are you doing this all online? Are you going to come to Somerville? So to date, we have been largely virtual. Uh, I am coming to you live from the attic that I had not spent more than 11 minutes in before the last 11 months, and now feel like I spend about 11 hours a day up here uh, at least. Uh, we're just now starting to plan out uh, how we can safely and responsibly uh, be with folks uh, at community events, um, you know, not just campaign events, but meeting people where they're at and where they're most comfortable. So the hope is over the rest of April and May and June and beyond each week, each month, we're doing a little bit more, um, building up to, to having more sort of campaign specific events uh, in the early summer and beyond. Um, again, done in a socially distanced, masked way uh, at the front end uh, and in keeping with the best practices. So I'm excited for that. I am hopeful we're gonna get there fairly soon. And I am, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, itching to get out there and, and really listen to folks and, and offer a bit of what uh, we think we can to, to build a fair, stronger Massachusetts. Fantastic. Well, I wish upon you success, perhaps a tough banner to replace that Rhode Island one behind your shoulder. I, I do have to tell you, if I, if I could get it in the screen, I have the Tufts one right next to it, right? Like we've got it, right? Like, so, <laughs> ah, there you go. So, so there we go. There we go. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Kat Powers at the Somerville Media Center. This has been a conversation with gubernatorial candidate Ben Downing. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kat.